When I received this invitation, I began thinking about what a banker might say today because we need to talk about things that we know something about. So I thought that I would cover, uh, that I wanted to share thoughts about uh, the challenges facing our economy and the banking industry. I also might want to tell you a little about our company, who we are, uh, why we've been able uh, to do well during some very difficult economic times. And then I thought I would end by sharing my own insights and uh, about leadership in today's business world. I really would have to say I've, I've probably been in banking all my life. Uh, my father, my uncles, my grandfather all worked for First Citizens and they have been great influences uh, when it comes to my own philosophy of leadership and who we are as a company. Uh, so the banking business was ingrained from me in the very beginning. Now I've been CEO at First Citizens for a little more than four years now and it's been a terrific opportunity and a great learning experience for me. And along with the honor, it has been a big challenge to run a financial institution in this day and age. As we all know, it's been a tough time for banks and many companies across our nation. The economic downturn began in 2007, right before I became CEO, and my mother reminded me that timing can be everything. And officially, it ended in, 2000, in June of 2009, but its effects are still around, and many of us are still digging out from it. And banks were at the forefront of this crisis, and have felt its impact as much as any industry. Now, despite, positive, despite some recent positive trends, there are still some 844 banks, or 11% of all the banks in the United States, are still identified as problem banks today. Now, that's down about 44 from its peak in March of 2011, but that reduction is mostly due to failures. I am cautiously optimistic about our recovery. It continues to be a long, slow journey. Both consumers and businesses have been stressed for lots of reasons, including an uncertain real estate market, increased regulatory oversight, and a stagnant job outlook. And while we're seeing a little light at the end of a long tunnel, a tunnel high gas prices, continued foreclosures, and economic issues in Europe continue to hold back our progress. As First Citizens Inv Chief Investment Officer Eric Thiel mentioned earlier today, the low interest rate environment we're experiencing is going to be with us for an extended period of time. The business community has really felt the impact of the economic downturn, and businesses are our nation's key job generator, and we all need to do what we can to support them. And it's critical that we foster a competitive business climate that doesn't hinder job creation and growth. The reality is the debt-driven boom that drove our economy half a decade ago is gone. Times have changed, and it's a brand new world out there. And I'm glad to report that our company, First Citizens Bank, is healthy. And for those of you that are not familiar with First Citizens, uh, we've been in business some 114 years. We are a homegrown North Carolina product, a bank. Uh, we operate in, four, in 430 locations spread over 17 states in the District of Columbia. You may have seen our branches throughout western North Carolina, and we do have a beautiful stone building in Boone uh, between 421 and 321 on the 105 extension. And we also have a, a branch in downtown Blowing Rock on Main Street. Now, since we opened in 1898, we've grown to be one of the top 50 largest financial holding companies in the United States with assets of about $21 billion. Our financial condition remains pretty strong. Liquidity is excellent. Capital levels are high. And our asset quality is comparatively clean. And part of the reason we've been able to weather the economic storm is that we've taken a road less traveled in the banking industry. 
It hasn't always been easy for us, especially when our philosophies ran counter to popular banking trends of the times. Stewardship of our clients' money has always been our top priority, and we were not a player in the subprime market. We did not take any government TARP funds, primarily due to our strong capital position. Before it was fashionable, our company exercised conservative lending and investment practices. So when the economic bubble burst a few years ago, the banking crisis hit, when the banking crisis hit, we avoided the most risky situations that we've all read about in the news. Now at First Citizens, we've always been risk averse and it's part of our corporate DNA, but I will confess that if I link back long enough, we were once criticized for it, while it, whereas now it's considered pretty cool. In addition, we've understood the importance of measured, controlled growth and have tended to expand in our own unique way in a manner that benefits our shareholders as well as our clients. During the Great, uh, during the great Depression, for example, one of my grandfather's most enduring legacies was to expand First Citizens into 12 Eastern North Carolina communities, even while other banks were failing. And we had the capital and the leadership to boldly move the company forward. And the parallel to what's happening today uh, is sort of striking. Our capitalization in, re in recent years has allowed us to uh, assist the banking industry and be a leader in acquiring six failed ac acquisitions across the country that have substantially expanded our franchise in a cost-effective manner. And every bank we've purchased fits strategically in our franchise because we already had a presence there and had, and had had some experience at being successful. And one reason we were able to grow in this manner is that First Citizens had the foresight to move to new, to new markets to other parts of the country in the 1990s and 2000s. Now, these moves were widely questioned in our industry because the locations were not contiguous to our traditional footprint and because of the startup cost involved. Establishing, establishing these markets, however, proved critical for us when we, were consent, continue, when we were considering expanding in the most recent recession. But even with this growth, I believe that our real success, the success at our company, uh, or at any company, but especially banking, is building long-term relationships with clients. Now, you're probably going to say that's an overused word. Uh, you hear that a lot, especially in our industry. And the difference at First Citizens is we like to believe that we have lived it for more than a century. Even with some positive trends, this is still a difficult time for banks. In fact, maybe outside of the government, I suspect that uh, banking might be among the most unpopular industries in the country. And one of the greatest challenges for our banking community is not the economic or regulatory, is not the economy or even regulatory oversight, but the demise of our most important asset, and that is your trust. At First Citizens, we have, main, we have worked hard to maintain trust, the trust of our clients. And I think my grandfather would be proud of the bank we are today. Now, whether you're a banker, an accountant, a university professor, a college student, the expectations are higher than ever on you and on us. For example, at times, the business world almost seems like a NASCAR race. Sort of an unusual analogy, but work with me here. Sort of start your engine and see how fast you can run, see how fast we can get to the finish line. And in NASCAR, teams have a history of pushing the envelope to compete. They take it right to the edge. They make one minor engine tweak or make some adjustment to the body that represents a fine line between competing the right way and the wrong way. And we've all heard people say, well, that's just racing. And how many times in business, or even in school, do we say that it's just part of the game, or I'm just doing my job? 
I want to contrast that with another sports example, one that I heard about recently, and that is the Northwestern College volleyball team in Roseville, Minnesota. And to demonstrate the principle of integrity, a very bold coach asked members of her team to begin making their own honor calls. Now, in other words, if a player tips an opponent's shot without the, without the referee noticing or the official noticing it, and the ball goes out of bounds, the player is expected to report it, and the team foregoes that point. Now, one of the students said, quote, it stinks giving up a point, but it feels right. Other teams have said, thank you for being honest. And if you want to be a person of integrity, you have to have it at all times. In this regard, the business world mirrors the sports world. And character and professionalism are essential in both, and they are not to be turned on and off. What I've learned from my grandfather and my father were principles and values that define our company to this day our long-term view of banking, our careful, consistent business practices, our care for our clients and associates, all these were things that they believed in and implanted at First Citizens. Adhering to these values has not only kept us strong but stable, and it's also a part of our considerable strategic advantage. We've had the same, uh, we have the same commitment uh, to new products, new services, and technology as other banks, but we haven't veered from much of the set of core values that were established even by my grandfather. The bank's personality has remained mar remarkably stable since that time. And it's this philosophy that has really shaped me and our company's culture. And that's what I believe truly makes us different from other institutions around today. And yes, we may have missed some profitability along the way. And we might have been called at one point in time boring or dismissed for being too physically conservative. But in this day and age, people do notice what you stand for. And we want people to say that I'm going to bank at First Citizens because they're stable. I can trust them with my money. They're going to do the right thing. They're not going to compromise the security of my assets regardless of the latest trends or economic situations. They have stood the test of time. And this brings me to a question that I often get on college campuses and it asks, what kind of employees are you looking for at your company? What kind of employees does First Citizens look for? Well, at First Citizens I get, I guess we ask a lot of questions, but we do take great care when we fill a position. And like many businesses, we want people who share our vision and embrace our culture. And people come to, who come to work for us must understand that we're interested in long-term value rather than short-term profits. And if they don't, that is often a recipe for a poor fit. We also demand integrity. We need individuals who will do the right things as well as do things right. In times like these, we're, all, uh, we're doing all we can to recognize and encourage our associates. We've tried to keep our health care benefits as affordable as we could. Our base pays are competitive. But more importantly, since I've been at the bank, our employees have never worried whether our company will fail. And frankly, during the economic downturn, uh, this downturn has reminded us, again, how fortunate we are as First Citizens Associates to be where we are. We do try to express appreciation for our associates. Uh, it's a leader's job to let people know how much they're valued, to give them the support they need. By recognizing the efforts of our associates in challenging times, we hope they will stay with us even when times get better and other opportunities come up. Our company's success both now and in the future rests with our associates. We require performance. We want people who will get involved in their communities. And of course, we do want strong leaders. 
And I promised you that I would talk about leadership today in today's new economic reality. And we often think of a leader as someone who has a great, big, expansive vision that's somewhere up in the stratosphere. And I'm going to confess that's not always true. You don't have to be a Walt Disney or a Henry Ford or a Sam Walton. You don't even have to be on the cutting edge like a Bill Gates at Microsoft or a Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. One definition of leadership that I like comes from Larry Bossidy. And many of you might not know who that is, but Larry Bossidy is the former Honeywell chairman and CEO. And he says that good leadership is basically the ability to get things done. It's just that simple. According to Bossidy, there are people who have a big vision, but don't always have the capacity to translate it into action. Leadership, he believes, is all about execution. And what I've found is that you don't always have to paint the sky. You don't always have to paint the sky with some grand picture or some overarching vision. However, you do, know how, you do have to be able to communicate effectively. And you must give direction and explanation why you want people to do something and why it's good for them and why it's good for the company. You do have to have passion. And you have to recognize who you are and understand your own skill sets. And you have to enable people with the ability to deliver. Remember, the real magic is making things happen. Now, besides the importance of execution, there are four additional characteristics of leadership that I've learned from my experience in the banking industry that I want to share today. And the first is that smart leaders must understand the importance of personal growth and education and make the most of their experiences. In banking terms, we would say that they must realize the, the importance of investing today for long-term success. Now let's take the example of the late Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple. Now, admittedly, after dropping out of college, he did decide to enroll in a calligraphy class. Jobs created the first Macintosh computer 10 years later. He installed all his calligraphy knowledge into it. And one of Mac's top selling points, and a big distinguishing factor for it, one of the hallmarks of this device was its stunning array of different typefaces. If Jobs had not taken that course, our computers likely today would not have the extensive typography that they do now. Jobs' educational investment certainly paid off for him in the long run, and the top leaders that I know understand the importance of learning and growing and making the most of their experiences. Being a student is a big commitment of time and energy. It's hard work, but like most worthwhile endeavors, you do get what you put into it. In my opinion, personal growth and education are some of the best investments an aspiring leader can make for both today and for the future. Second, strong leaders recognize that relationships matter. In banking, our business is about money, but it's also about people and meeting their needs. Success in business and in life is directly tied to building relationships and nurturing relationships with others. Larry Bosti said that the number one essential behavior for an executive is to know your people and know your business. And I think this is very true. Every CEO, every leader will be faced with critical decisions along the way. Just as important as choosing the correct path is how you march down that road and who's marching beside you. At First Citizens, or at any bank or retail company, a lot of research goes into making sure a new office is on the right corner. But even more important than in price point, location, curb appeal, is a lesson that I learned from my father that can be applied to people. Ensuring the right person in the right, is in the right place and, understand, and understands your customers 
and your community is critical. It's not just about business. More than ever, we need to develop relationships. We need to know, we need to be able to work with others to accomplish our goals so we can make a difference in our homes, in our careers, and even in our communities. And that's a major part of what a university like Appalachian is all about. Some of the greatest experiences we have at school, at work, and in life are the interactions and connections that we make with others. In today's hectic world, relationships matter really more than ever, and the best leaders understand this and seek to build those connections with others. Now, third, great leaders are change managers. Now, at the bank, my kids think about tellers as being literally responsible for making change with money, but you and I are talking about a different kind of change. In a different sense, one of the most important characteristics of a leader is handling change in your organization. At First Citizens, we've been reminding our bankers that it's been five years since the Great Recession hit. And the banking world as, as, the banking world as we know it has certainly changed. And it's almost useless for us to wish that things will turn around and go back like they were just a few years ago. The banking industry is evolving, and we cannot rest on our past accomplishments. We tell our associates that there's a brave new world out there, and we've got to adapt and continue to move forward. And even with all the things that we've been hoping we're doing right in our business, these current times are very challenging for us just as they are for many others. We've had to tighten our own belts. We're keeping an eye out for our expenses and costs just as many other companies are. And that's why we're focusing on new, st new strategies and changes to our branch network and our corporate structure. We're also launching new products such as mobile banking so we can compete more effectively and grow our business and attract new customers and stay relevant in the banking industry. A strong change manager engages employees in the process early on and communicates why change is needed and what the new path will be. A change leader also keeps employees focused on a clear, simple, and basic objective. Change often requires training and a new skill development or enhancement so that leaders work to ensure that associates embrace what they need to learn. And most of all, a change leader sets the example. Showing someone how to be more successful is much more effective than telling a person how to go about it. And this brings me to our fourth characteristic, which has a banking theme, and that is that great leaders take all they have invested in themselves and give back with interest. Now, in basic terms, interest is the percentage of the amount that you have on deposit that you're allowing your bank to hold for you so that they can lend it to others. An interest-bearing life is one in which you take all those long-term investments that you've made in yourself, education, relationships, and give back a portion to your community and the world. Each year, many students at this, at this university demonstrate the importance of giving back with interest. And I have found some examples, and you may be, some, you may be one of these examples. Students at the Walker College of Business are using their business skills to help develop a village in, Southeast Af in the Southeast African Republic of Malawi to construct a corn mill. Other ASU students gave up their spring break time to provide food for the hungry, construct homes for the homeless, and teach school children, both domestically and abroad, through the Alternative Service Experience, Services Experience Program. Here in Boone, some of the members of the Wake Fellows Student Group are participating in the upcoming Campus Relay for Life, for Life event that supports the American Cancer Society. These types of efforts, and many, many others, do make a lasting difference. The most successful people that I know have developed interest-bearing lives, and they share their time, talents, and wealth with others. They don't hoard their success, 
that they've achieved in education or in business, or hide their skills under a proverbial mattress, they give it back with interest. What they've gained, they pay it forward. They go beyond what is expected of them. And the concept of developing an interest-bearing life reminds me of a story about a top executive who was asked by, uh, who was at his retirement dinner, was asked by his employees to d divulge the secret of his success. And upon his retirement, this businessman shared three simple words, just three words, as a way to, for explanation for all his great accomplishments. And those words were, and then some. And then some. He understood that these three words were the difference between average workers and the top people in most companies. The businessman explained that the top people always do what's expected of them, and then some. They are thoughtful of others. They are considerate. They are kind, and then some. They meet their responsibilities fairly and squarely, and then some. They are good friends and they're helpful neighbors, and then some. Appalachian cultivates this in its students and faculty, this concept of an interest-bearing life. And we all should let, should let the words, and then some, drive our actions. Now in banking and in business, it's a new day. And times have changed, margins are thinner, the challenges are greater, and change continues to come at us faster than ever, faster than what we want. In business and in life, you cannot control what comes at you, but you can choose how to respond, and that takes true leadership. In closing, my wish for you, for all the students in this room, is to embrace your experience here at Appalachian. And if you're a business owner or a community leader, or, or whether you do that now or plan to in the future, uh, that seek to get good things done. Keep investing in yourselves and build lasting relationships in this community. Learn to manage life's changes and continue to give back with interest and then some. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed being with you. <laughs>